us anymore. People say to me, who's your favorite director? And I always say Victor Fleming, and I get a blank look. Oh, he was a great director. He did Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind in the same year. He did Test Pilot, Treasure Island, Red Dust, and Bombshell, A Guy Named Joe, films that stand the test of time. Victor Fleming was a man's man who didn't showboat, but who worked at the top of his game. He wasn't part of the herd of thinking. He was out there doing his own thing. No problem, we can attach a 400-pound camera to the side of a boat out in the middle of the ocean in a storm and get amazing shots. That's part stuntman in him, part cinematographer in him, part outdoor man in him. Unlike a Hawks film or a Ford film or a Hitchcock film, he bleeds into the material. He could immerse himself in any genre and excel at it. Few knew how to master all the aspects of cinematic art as Fleming did. I think you could call him a master craftsman. Fleming was one of those guys of a generation who had lived life before becoming a movie director. Victor came from this American pioneer story that he never lost touch with. His parents came out to the west from Missouri. Uh, they were land boomers. It was in a tent in La Canada, right outside Pasadena, that Victor was born in 1889. His parents worked in the orange orchards in San Dimas, and his dad actually died in one of the orange orchards when Victor was just four. So he was brought up by his uncle and aunt, Ed and Mamie Hartman. He actually dropped out of school when he was 13 or 14 and he went to work uh, as a bicycle repairman in a shop that also sold Eldridge motor cars. So he quickly became an auto repairman. Vic's expertise with cars in 1914 was a prime working asset. Uh, there weren't many drivers in the whole country. Alan Dwan, who was uh, the key director at the Flying A movie company in Santa Barbara. He was in the company of Marshall Nalen who became Mary Pickford's favorite director. The two of them were having car trouble. Marshall Nalen told Alan Dwan, you know, I know a guy around here, he works as a chauffeur for a wealthy family. He knows everything about cars. Let's just drive over there and get it fixed. They drive over to this glacial Santa Barbara estate, and there in the back is a guy with a gun conducting target practice. It's Victor, and Victor, without turning around, says, uh, hey, fella, your tappet valve is stuck. <laughs> and they were so impressed. In the background are cameras and photos. Alan Dwan said, have you ever thought of going to the movie picture business. And Victor said, yes, I have. Is there any money in it? There's plenty of work to do and good men to do it. Come on, let's get moving. I want you to meet the boss. Victor went to work at the Flying A. He worked as a driver, a stuntman, uh, a developer in a camera lab. And then he became a cinematographer with Douglas Fairbanks Sr., one of the major stars of the silent period. Fairbanks was a very physical actor. He was known to just leap around and, and somersault. Victor saw that action, movement, just progression would propel uh, movies into becoming the great popular art of the 20th century. They are making uh, all sorts of movies that are uh, incredibly successful. Victor really thinks this is his future. And suddenly, uh, something even bigger than Fairbanks breaks on the horizon. World War One. He became one of the guys who made some of the first military instruction films. He got the highest security clearance so he could record the comings and goings of the Hoboken port, which was a, a very high security area in World War I. And he was ready to get back to Fairbanks when suddenly he gets picked to be the cameraman for Woodrow Wilson's Paris Peace Conference. No other sitting American president had left American territory on this kind of trip. And there is Victor Fleming, and there's uh, an amazing shot of people waving goodbye to the ship and Victor is panning with them and he suddenly realized that they're on the top of a pier building. He threw himself into it the way he'd thrown himself into everything with exuberance and invention and great energy. He pioneered uses of slow motion uh, and other techniques that he brought into features when he came back from the war. When he got back, Fairbanks had him shoot the first movie that Fairbanks made for his United Artists Corporation. Then he became a director under Douglas Fairbanks. 
When the Clouds Roll By, became Vic's debut feature and one of the great debut features in American history. As soon as he heard about sound coming in, he actually knocked on the offices of the moguls at Paramount and said, you need to teach us how to do sound. You can't just do it with your sound department. You can't just do it with these Broadway directors. Fleming was one of the few directors to make the transition from silent to sound films. The Virginian was the first great sound western and the movie that cemented the image of Gary Cooper as the strong silent type of American movies. Then soon after, he got the most important letter of his life. It was an invitation to MGM Studios to do The Wet Parade. It was an amazingly important movie for him. It cemented his ability to work at that studio with people like Irving Thalberg and Louis B. Mayer. And it also united him with John Lee Mann. Together, they would work on Bombshell, Treasure Island, Captain's Courageous, Test Pilot, The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and red dust. Okay, what's the idea? What? Getting in that barrel. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm going over Niagara Falls. What? Red dust was his first sensation at MGM. Didn't always star Clark Gable. It was meant as a vehicle for John Gilbert. But John Lee Mayen saw Gable in a film and said, we got to sign this guy. He's got the eyes of a woman and the build of a bull. I'm not a one-woman man. I never have been and I never will be. And if you want to take your turn... All right, that make you feel any better. MGM wanted to make a movie called Bombshell about an exploited star whose family was rapacious and always sponging off her and she was surrounded by toadies who really did her no good. Lola, I've just seen Gillette about an extension of your contract. He says... Don't bother me now, Ike. I've, but the new contract... I've got a special Cadillac sports job out in front of Miss Burns. I thought perhaps you'd like to take a look at it. It's slight and used. Yeah, i got three cars of my own now, and they're all used. Here's that endowment policy, Miss Burns. 20-year pay life with health and accident Say, what cars. do you fellas do? Sleep here? Yeah, but this the is the one that your father and I went over. Like if you want to look at screwball comedy and examine the genesis, I think you go to Bombshell. Why are my bills paid? Where does my money go? I never see any of it. You're excited. Well, what are you yourself? mewling about? Don't think I don't know about you and your stealing and the cuts you get from the stores. Oh, listen, sis. And you who never haven't had a job to your name for three years and bringing her in here like it was a hotel for traveling salesmen. Prior to Bombshell, there had never been a film paced that way about that subject. And that was very much what became the template for screwball comedies, such as Hawks. Five years later, he did Bringing Up Baby. Well, where is the right in there. I don't believe you, Susan. But you have to believe me. I've been the victim truth. of your unbridled imagination once more. All the way you talking about that. <laughs> Whenever people want to make a, a big Hollywood, inside Hollywood movie, uh, they look to Bombshell. In fact, when Sing in the Rain was on, in the works, uh, Gene Kelly and Stanley Donan, they took a look at Bombshell. All right, now, give them another broad set, all together. One, two, three. Victor Fleming had always wanted to be a director of epics, and he got his biggest chance uh, yet when uh, MGM assigned him to Treasure Island. Well, Sonny, was you aiming to blow the other leg off? It had been filmed several times before, but not in any version that really took hold of the public's imagination. Vix really did. It was the ultimate studio production in that every division of the studio's labors, the costume department, the prop department, the set department, they all were working full force for Treasure Island. Vic showed that with Treasure Island, he could make one of the great family films of all time. Captain's Courageous was the first of five films he made with Spencer Tracy. Tracy at the time at MGM was known as being probably the most gifted actor on the lot, but he was also known to be unmanageable. Tracy had gone on a binge and was trying to dry out when his friend Victor Fleming came in with a case of scotch and said, drink this case of scotch, in which case you'll never see me again, or you can get up and get back to work with me. Okay, I'm sober now. With all that, he gave a performance of such purity that it won him his first Best Actor Oscar. The movie itself was MGM's biggest moneymaker of the year. It was just such a solid story. The spoiled little Machiavellian brat who gets dumped overboard and taken up by Spencer Tracy and learns how to become a man. I just found it so powerful and emotional um, and was also truly amazed 
beyond the emotion and the story of it at the scope. I told you so! Now what do I do? Some of the sequences at the time of the, you know, the mast falling down into the water and people dumping into the ocean. Filmmakers' movies are a representation of who they are. He was a real man's man, and I think a lot of those things came with him to Captain's Courageous. Captain's Courageous gave him a chance to use everything he'd learned in his 20-year history up to then of doing movies. What are you talking about? You're not going. He'll save you. We have good times together, they little people. We laugh, we sing, so you smile. Come on, smile. You'll be all right, see, Matthew? Come on, Wally, be watching you. You'll be the best fisherman ever. No, no, Matthew, no! Courageous showed other filmmakers that you could do something about surrogate fathers and surrogate sons that wasn't mawkish. It became a kind of artistic high point that a lot of other filmmakers reached for. Amen. Fleming was an aviator. He owned his own plane. He was always very interested in flying. He was interested in the daring do of test pilots. See, that's nothing. It's nice to have a little fire. You don't know how cold it gets up there. In Test Pilot, Gable is playing the title role as someone who really is a movie star of the air. Tracy is the guy who enables him to have this incredible charmed career because Tracy is the nuts and bolts guy who keeps the planes running. Test Pilot is the apotheosis of the buddy film, a whole other genre Fleming mastered. If I don't see you again, it'll be too soon. And if I never see that ugly bat of yours again, it'll be too soon. It's funny because none of the people involved in Test Pilot wanted to make the movie except Victor. Myrna Loy says in her autobiography that she didn't quite get it. And then Gable, apparently. It isn't always right in the text. It's in the way it's going to be treated. Victor was the only one who saw that there was this a great a triangle and then a great quadrangle. The sky is the ultimate mistress for any pilot. And that idea of the sky as this taunting mistress uh, shows up in movie after movie after that. It's the best film of that subject ever made. All the great actors that he directed, Gary Cooper and Spencer Tracy and Clark Gable and on and on, they wanted to be like him. Victor Fleming was a man's man and he was a woman's man. He was named the Beau Brummel of Hollywood, meaning he was not only the great lover but the great chivalrous lover and the great lover that everyone wanted to have. Making a movie with him was sort of a surefire way of falling in love with him. Victor Fleming had that power. The list of lovers he had is amazing. Virginia Valley, Kathleen Clifford, Clara Bow, Lily Demita, Norma Shearer, who later went on to marry Irving Thalberg and become the first lady of MGM, Lupe Velez, and Bessie Love, and various than sundry. In the late 20s, Lou Rawson became his sounding board for his private life. They did get married, and when Lou did give Vic his first child, Vicky, uh, then soon after, his younger daughter, Sally, he became just a devoted family man, and it became a much bigger part of his life, actually, than his so-called womanizing had ever been before. All right, honey, you go on back on the set. They'll be looking all over the lot for you. You just trust old space. He'll fix it up for you. By the late 30s, Victor Fleming had become the Mr. Fix-It of the MGM Studios. He gained that reputation because of his total knowledge of every area of filmmaking. He had almost a surgical ability to hone in on what ailed a troubled production and cure it. They knew they could always go to Victor Fleming because he could direct anything. 
he could go on to a film for a few days and fix a crucial sequence, whether it was a, a fight or an emotional sequence, like a scene in the crowd wars where a boy discovers that his uh, mom is dead. Crowd Roars was a fight movie, and I played Bob Taylor as a boy. Always give your money to the church, I say. <laughs> it was a retake from that film. Richard Thorpe was not available, and they asked Victor Fleming to come in and shoot that added scene. And there he was with the white hair and the gray flannel suit, single-breasted, with a white tennis shirt with a collar and so forth. He treated me like an old friend, Frank Morgan. That beautiful character actor, beautiful person too, it was my father. And Frank Morgan sat there and he read this letter. And so I'm supposed to look at this letter and burst into tears. We're starting this scene, I pick up the letter and I'm looking at it and I'm cold. Now in those days, if a kid couldn't cry, he was out of the business. It was cry or perish. And finally Fleming jumps up and he takes the, the letter and he says, Gene, Gene, you can do this. It's easy, he said, you pick up the letter and you read. There's your, the, the, there's your mother is lost. And you, she's, now Fleming at this point is fighting for his breath. The tears well up, the face is breaking all up. And he's looking pleadingly into my face. And I said, I got it. And I took the letter away from him. He says, roll him. And we played the scene, the tears came. <laughs> In The Great Waltz, he came on to a movie that was a fictionalized version of the life of Johann Strauss, The Waltz King. He not only reshot, rescripted, and re-edited it, he made it an enormous hit. In fact, it established beyond all doubt that Victor Fleming was the guy to go to to fix films, even if they were incredibly expensive and complicated and had already started shooting. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. <laughs> Wizard of Oz had started production with Richard Thorpe and then started production with George Cukor and both of them had contributed in ways but the production wasn't what MGM wanted it to be. So good old reliable Victor Fleming who had no prep at all comes in and wants to make a good picture and not only a good picture but a good picture for his kids. His daughters today say that he really made The Wizard of Oz for them because he wanted to give them a gift that would last beyond his own lifetime. He loved children, and you can see that in The Wizard of Oz. Then close your eyes and tap your heels together three times and think to yourself, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's, there's no, no place like home. There's no place like home. Victor and Mayen rewrote the script. They completely revised the opening of the film. Before they came on board, there was no You Follow the Yellow Brick Road song. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. He knew from his own dramatic instincts that we needed a good punchy send-off, so he told the songwriting team of E.Y. Harburg and Harold Arlen, give me something to send them out. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. Follow, follow, The Wizard of Oz was Vic's first color film, and it became really the color film that, for its style, all other color films are measured against. There's a couple of weeks left to shoot, and it was the Kansas stuff, which is black and white, when Judy's singing over the rainbow and so forth. He's pulled off to go to Selznick International down the street in Culver City to take over Gone with the Wind. George Cukor, who had prepared Gone with the Wind for years with David O. Selznick, wasn't working out. 
Cukor left after about three weeks. Gable had wanted Fleming to direct Gone with the Wind from the beginning, but had never played that hand. He was the total professional. He didn't sabotage Cukor, uh, but once Cukor was out, Fleming was both uh, Gable's man and everyone else's obvious choice because he was the big picture guy who could fix anything. No, I don't think I will kiss you. Although you need kissing badly. That's what's wrong with you. You should be kissed and often. And by someone who knows how. Everyone had an idea of who Rhett Butler should be because the book had been such a tremendous bestseller. Gable needed someone who made him feel confident that he could do it, and Fleming was that person. Over time, people think of Gone with the Wind as David O. Selznick's film. David Selznick had a whole line of publicity people, and he wants all the credit for Gone with the Wind. If you look at the memos that David O. Selznick wrote during the production, they clearly show you that Victor was operating as his first director, not just as one director among many. I got news for you. David Selznick did not direct Gone with the Wind. Victor Fleming did. And Fleming ultimately received the Academy Award as best director. I cannot accept this without paying tribute to those really responsible for much of the picture's success. The uh, crew behind the camera to whom I am deeply grateful. Thank you. It was such an enormous movie. The scale of it was so big. It epitomized a certain kind of Oscar movie from then on in. A movie that was often a period movie, often of an epic scale. The sweeping shots, the shot of Scarlet walking amongst all those bodies of soldiers laying there, that feels completely Fleming to me because it's epic. There's this great shot down the flight of stairs into Gable. It's not a star-making moment because Gable was already a star, but it was almost like a star-sanctifying moment. It was like, yes, here is Gable as you've always wanted to see him. Fred, you go. Where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Henry Hathaway, another great director who trained under Fleming, set out right when you see Gable on screen, you're watching Victor Fleming. His attitude, his sexual authority, his humor, uh, that all that came from Victor Fleming. He really has the reputation for building careers of people like Clark Gable and Gary Cooper and Spencer Tracy. He made them better than they were. He was a great director of men, but he also got some wonderful performances out of women. Confederate Army's got the same trouble, clawing clothes and dysentery. Hattie McDaniel won an Oscar. That was a major deal in 1939 to award an African-American actor with an Oscar. If you can't help us, who can? Mr. Red always set great store by your opinion. Please, Miss Melly. I'll do what I can, baby. Victor Fleming is, is always perceived as a man's man and a director of he-men. But if you look at his actual track record, he's equally strong with actresses. Actresses who were not known for their talent or respected for their talent until they worked with him. It happened with Clara Bow on Man Trap. It happened with Gene Harlow on Red Dust, followed by Bombshell, which was sort of a one-two punch that completely shifted her image from this untalented platinum blonde to the first great screwball comedian of the 1930s. Victor early on got a reputation for doing whatever was necessary <laughs> to get the results from an actor or an actress. There was no union back then, so actors were sometimes treated or mistreated at the whim of the director. You're treating me as if I was something Bob had brought home with him from the African bush. Oh, no. Vivian Lee resisted him from the outset and was secretly going to Cukor to tell her how to play the scenes. Vivian Lee was known to have resented him because he would say, ham it up, baby, ham it up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This war talk's spoiling all the fun at every party this spring. I get so bored I could scream. And for someone who had been trained in Britain and someone who was personally involved with Laurence Olivier, that was not a welcome direction. But what she didn't understand at the time and what he understood, even while they were shooting Gone with the Wind, was this was melodrama. This was historical melodrama. It couldn't be played as British drawing room drama. So I think the fights that he had with her, I think was not just meant to put her down, I don't think he would ever do that, but to actually get her dander up and to get her to be the steely, combative Scarlet that is so much a part of Gone with the Wind. As God is my witness, as God is my witness, they're not going to lick me. I'm going to live through this and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. Oh. 
The most famous example of Victor Fleming going to severe lengths to extract a performance out of someone is on The Wizard of Oz, when Judy Garland was shooting the Yellow Brick Road sequence with the Tin Man, the Lion, and the Scarecrow, and they were cracking her up. She got the giggles, she couldn't stop. Victor Fleming walked down, looked at her, and slapped her in the face and said, now, behave. You're a very bad man. Victor felt terrible about that and was berating himself for doing it. Shame on you! Judy Garland came up to Victor afterwards and said, I won't bop you on the nose for doing that, I'll kiss you on the nose. 30 years later, Judy Garland would still tell stories about how much she admired him, and I think he functioned in her dynamic as a father figure because he was disciplining her. Well, I'm glad to see you're not really hurt. Oh, but I am, Doctor. Really? Really? Maybe I better send you to the hospital, huh? No. Oh, look. Here. Feel. Feel. Where, here? Oh. Mm hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Just as I thought. Cirrhosis pectoris. Uh, what's that mean? That means your eyes are twin pools of desire. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde started in a very ironic way for Victor Fleming because Selznick uh, wanted Bergman to work with Fleming. Selznick knew that Fleming had this talent for bringing new things out of actresses, even if, like Vivian Leigh, they didn't realize he was doing it. Bergman fell in love with Fleming immediately. She said she could look at his eyes and she could know exactly uh, whether he was pleased or displeased or enraged or frustrated, but also what emotion he wanted to get out of her. When the bad command is playing, that's it. my feet begin to go. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> For the rollicking jumping polka. That's it. It's the funniest thing I know. Bravo! A prima donna is born. Victor wanted to do a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he said, that was not just something out of, you know, gaslit rooms in the 19th century, but to show an idea of pure evil that would work as well if you could imagine it you know, running through the streets of the United States in 1940. It was actually Ingrid Bergman, I think, though, that really sparked uh, Victor's creativity, and the combination was spectacular. Men say that I... I ain't a bad looker when I'm more myself. You liked me once a little bit, too. She actually would have thrown herself at him if she thought she would get anywhere with him, but Vic was a faithful a family man, and he wouldn't fall for Bergman until many years later. You're going to be home at your place tonight, huh? Got to get into town, huh? You didn't answer my question. Why don't you answer your own questions? Even with stars who he only worked with once, he had this amazing sense of how to get them on board and part of his team. Uh, so when he made Tortilla Flat, he just didn't sense that Garfield was meshing with Hedy Lamarr, his romantic interest in the movie. After just a couple of days, he uh, called Garfield aside and said, you know, I had to scream and yell and beg to get you from Warner Brothers, and now you're not doing anything for me. What's going on here? Garfield realized he had something on the line here, and he, he went out and acted the heck out of the scene, and Victor then pulled him back and said, yeah, that was better, but you know, it was too good. <laughs> I want you to be... Because, <laughs> you know, this, this Hedy Lamarr, she's, she's not what we call unoutclassable. Garfield got the message of he had to be uh, you know, on his game, and he also had to be acting with the other person in the scene. They both refer to it as a very happy experience for them. Hedy Lamarr said it was the best role she ever had. Sweet, you. You get out of here. You crazy, sweet? You get up. The cast includes Hedy Lamarr, <laughs> this Austrian lady, Spencer Tracy, the Irishman, Akim Tamirov, the Russian. They're all playing the Pazanos, you know. Ay, ay, ay. There's not one in the bunch that you could say would even be a half Pazano. <laughs> but it's very believable. It really is, and it's funny. Oh, how I know as long as it is not mine. <laughs> it's Pete Sandwich's squadron. I'll bet you he's the best flyer in the whole world. Spielberg was uh, a great admirer of Victor Fleming's, and he actually remade uh, a guy named Joe in a film called Always. What about me? You know, I remember a poem I learned once. I had to learn, as a matter of fact. Uh, 
men must work and women must weep. I remember that women must weep <coughs> part. That... So that's the way you figure it. Women must weep. What claptrap. When you crack up, I'm supposed to sit around wet-eyed like an old man with asthma and mumble prayers the rest of my life. What a surprise you're going to get. Uh, you might at least crack out with a bottle. Do you know what I'll do? Sure, you'll cry like everything. I'll not cry. I'll get out and find myself a man with good sense. You'll never find as good a flyer. He was so moved by a guy named Joe, which is one of the great anti-war films ever made. We're bailing out, boys. Ingrid Bergman, as we know from Jekyll and Hyde, adored Vic. Her dream project had always been to do a Joan of Arc movie, and she saw Victor as the director who could get that movie made. They reconnected instantly, emotionally, and more intensely than you know, Vic had allowed himself to do before. And he knew that this was going against a lot of his codes. He had been faithful to his wife since the early 30s, but here he was running into this passionate love affair with Ingrid Bergman. He had worked with stars he loved before, but never with one who was also a co-producer and who had her own strong feelings, much stronger feelings than he had for the subject matter. I don't think he completely knew the extent that he had been blinded uh, until he really saw the finished film. He would watch the movie in tears, saying to John Lee Mayen he didn't know what was wrong. The sets were so beautiful, Ingrid was so spectacular, and Mayen reportedly said, well, Vic, because it's the first film she ever directed. The reviews were not what they needed for this kind of movie. And just weeks after its premiere, Victor died of a heart attack. He was the quintessential film director. You can look at a Fleming film, not know it's a Fleming film, and you can see his work there. You can see the way shots are framed and lit, the way characters are either brought together or kept apart that are pure Victor Fleming. I wish I never saw you. If you look at his work, you can't help but feel like he was a humanist. I love you, Scarlett. In spite of you and me and the whole silly world going to pieces around us, I love you. The work is so varied, but there's this kind of core emotion to all of the movies. I think he found the heart heart inside of every movie and that's what comes through in these films oh Annie M. there's no place like home as long as his films stay with us his legacy is alive at a point 